on Education by Arthur Schopenhauer, 1851, translated by Mrs. Rudolf Dirks, narrated by an artificial intelligence based on the voice of Tony J. Produced by Parker Banks at pbanks.net and youtube.com slash pbanks. The nature of our intellect is such that ideas are said to spring by abstraction from observations so that the latter are in existence before the former. If this is really what takes place, as is the case with a man who has merely his own experience as his teacher and book, he knows quite well which of his observations belong to and are represented by each of his ideas. He is perfectly acquainted with both, and accordingly he treats everything correctly that comes before his notice. We might call this the natural mode of education. On the other hand, an artificial education is having one's head crammed full of ideas, derived from hearing others talk, from learning and reading, before one has anything like an extensive knowledge of the world as it is and as one sees it. The observations which produce all these ideas are said to come later on with experience, but until then these ideas are applied wrongly, and accordingly both things and men are judged wrongly, seen wrongly, and treated wrongly. And so it is that education perverts the mind, and this is why, after a long spell of learning and reading, we enter the world in our youth with views that are partly simple, partly perverted. Consequently, we comport ourselves with an air of anxiety at one time, at another of presumption. This is because our head is full of ideas which we are now trying to make use of, but almost always apply wrongly. This is the result of Ustieron Protieron, putting the cart before the horse since we are directly opposing the natural development of our mind by obtaining ideas first and observations last. For teachers, instead of developing in a boy his faculties of discernment and judgment, and of thinking for himself, merely strive to stuff his head full of other people's thoughts. Subsequently, all the opinions that have sprung from misapplied ideas have to be rectified by a lengthy experience, and it is seldom that they are completely rectified. This is why so few men of learning have such sound common sense as is quite common among the illiterate. From what has been said, the principal point in education is that one's knowledge of the world begins at the right end, and the attainment of which might be designated as the aim of all education. But, as has been pointed out, this depends principally on the observation of each thing preceding the idea one forms of it. Further, that narrow ideas proceed broader, so that the whole of one's instruction is given in the order that the ideas themselves during formation must have followed. But directly this order is not strictly adhered to, imperfect and subsequently wrong ideas spring up, and finally there arises a perverted view of the world in keeping with the nature of the individual, a view such as almost everyone holds for a long time, and most people to the end of their lives. If a man analyzes his own character, he will find that it was not until he reached a very ripe age, and in some cases quite unexpectedly, that he was able to rightly and clearly understand many matters of a quite simple nature. Previously, there had been an obscure point in his knowledge of the world which had arisen through his omitting something in his early education, whether he had been either artificially educated by men or just naturally by his own experience. Therefore, one should try to find out the strictly natural course of knowledge, so that by keeping methodically to it, children may become acquainted with the affairs of the world without getting false ideas into their heads which frequently cannot be driven out again. In carrying this out, one must next take care that children do not use words with which they connect no clear meaning. Even children have, as a rule, that unhappy tendency of being satisfied with words instead of wishing to understand things and of learning words by heart so that they may make use of them when they are in a difficulty. This tendency clings to them afterwards, so that the knowledge of many learned men becomes mere verbosity. However, the principal thing must always be to let one's observations precede one's ideas, and not the reverse as is usually and unfortunately the case, which may be likened to a child coming into the world with its feet foremost, or a rhyme begun before thinking of its reason. While the child's mind has made a very few observations, one inculcates it with ideas and opinions which are, strictly speaking, prejudices. 
His observations and experience are developed through this ready-made apparatus instead of his ideas being developed out of his own observations. In viewing the world, one sees many things from many sides. Consequently, this is not such a short or quick way of learning as that which makes use of abstract ideas and quickly comes to a decision about everything. Therefore, preconceived ideas will not be rectified until late, or it may be they are never rectified. For when a man's view contradicts his ideas, he will reject at the outset what it renders evident as one-sided. Nay, he will deny it and shut his eyes to it, so that his preconceived ideas may remain unaffected. And so it happens that many men go through life full of oddities, caprices, fancies and prejudices until they finally become fixed ideas. He has never attempted to abstract fundamental ideas from his own observations and experience because he has got everything ready-made from other people. And it is for this very reason that he and countless others are so insipid and shallow. Instead of such a system, the natural system of education should be employed in educating children. No idea should be impregnated, but what has come through the medium of observations, or at any rate been verified by them. A child would have fewer ideas, but they would be well grounded and correct. It would learn to measure things according to its own standard and not according to another's. It would then never acquire a thousand whims and prejudices which must be eradicated by the greater part of subsequent experience and education. Its mind would henceforth be accustomed to thoroughness and clearness. The child would rely on its own judgment and be free from prejudices. And in general, children should not get to know life in any aspect whatever from the copy before they have learnt it from the original. Instead, therefore, of hastening to place mere books in their hands, one should make them gradually acquainted with things and the circumstances of human life, and above everything one should take care to guide them to a clear grasp of reality and to teach them to obtain their ideas directly from the real world and to form them in keeping with it, but not to get them from elsewhere, as from books, fables, or what others have said, and then later to make use of such ready-made ideas in real life. The result will be that their heads are full of chimeras and that some will have a wrong comprehension of things and others will fruitlessly endeavor to remodel the world according to those chimeras and so get onto wrong paths both in theory and practice. For it is incredible how much harm is done by false notions which have been implanted early in life only to develop later on into prejudices. The later education which we get from the world and real life must be employed in eradicating these early ideas. And this is why, as is related by Diogenes Laertius, Antisthenes gave the following answer. When asked what was the most necessary thing to take up, he replied to unlearn what is bad. Children should be kept from all kinds of instruction that may make errors possible until their sixteenth year that is to say from philosophy, religion, and general views of every description, because it is the errors that are acquired in early days that remain, as a rule, ineradicable, and because the faculty of judgment is the last to arrive at maturity. They should only be interested in such things that make errors impossible, such as mathematics, in things which are not very dangerous, such as languages, natural science, history, and so forth. In general, the branches of knowledge which are to be taken up at any age must be within reach of the intellect at that age and perfectly comprehensible to it. Childhood and youth are the time for collecting data and getting to know specially and thoroughly individual and particular things. On the other hand, all judgment of a general nature must at that time be suspended and final explanations left alone. One should leave the faculty of judgment alone, as it only comes with maturity and experience, and also take care that one does not anticipate it by inculcating prejudice when it will be crippled forever. On the contrary, the memory is to be specially exercised, as it has its greatest strength and tenacity in youth. However, what has to be retained must be chosen with the most careful and scrupulous consideration. For as it is what we have learnt well in our youth that lasts, we should take the greatest possible advantage of this precious gift. If we picture to ourselves how deeply engraven on our memory the people are whom we knew during the first twelve years of our life, and how indelibly imprinted are also the events of that time, 
and most of the things that we then experienced, heard, or learnt, the idea of basing education on this susceptibility and tenacity of the youthful mind will seem natural, in that the mind receives its impressions according to a strict method and a regular system. But because the years of youth that are assigned to man are only few, and the capacity for remembering in general is always limited, and still more so the capacity for remembering of the individual, everything depends on the memory being filled with what is most essential and important in any department of knowledge to the exclusion of everything else. This selection should be made by the most capable minds and masters in every branch of knowledge after the most mature consideration and the result of it established. Such a selection must be based on a sifting of matters which are necessary and important for a man to know in general, and also for him to know in a particular profession or calling. Knowledge of the first kind would have to be divided into graduated courses, like an encyclopedia, corresponding to the degree of general culture which each man has attained in his external circumstances. From a course restricted to what is necessary for primary instruction up to the matter contained in every branch of the philosophical faculty. Knowledge of the second kind would, however, be reserved for him who had really mastered the selection in all its branches. The whole would give a canon specially devised for intellectual education, which naturally would require revision every ten years. By such an arrangement, the youthful power of the memory would be put to the best advantage, and it would furnish the faculty of judgment with excellent material when it appeared later on. What is meant by maturity of knowledge is that state of perfection to which any one individual is able to bring it when an exact correspondence has been effected between the whole of his abstract ideas and his own personal observations whereby each of his ideas rests directly or indirectly on a basis of observation which alone gives it any real value. And likewise, he is able to place every observation that he makes under the right idea corresponding to it. Maturity of knowledge is the work of experience alone and consequently of time. For the knowledge we acquire from our own observation is, as a rule, distinct from that we get through abstract ideas. The former is acquired in the natural way, while the latter comes through good and bad instruction and what other people have told to us. Consequently, in youth, there is generally little harmony and connection between our ideas, which mere expressions have fixed, and our real knowledge, which has been acquired by observation. Later, they both gradually approach and correct each other, but maturity of knowledge does not exist until they have become quite incorporated. This maturity is quite independent of that other kind of perfection, the standard of which may be high or low, I mean the perfection to which the capacities of an individual may be brought. It is not based on a correspondence between the abstract and intuitive knowledge, but on the degree of intensity of each. The most necessary thing for the practical man is the attainment of an exact and thorough knowledge of what is really going on in the world, but it is also the most irksome, for a man may continue studying until old age without having learnt all that is to be learnt, while one can master the most important things in the sciences in one's youth. In getting such a knowledge of the world, it is as a novice that the boy and youth have the first and most difficult lessons to learn, but frequently even the matured man has still much to learn. The study is of considerable difficulty in itself, but it is made doubly difficult by novels which depict the ways of the world and of men who do not exist in real life. But these are accepted with the credulity of youth and become incorporated with the mind, so that now, in the place of purely negative ignorance, a whole framework of wrong ideas, which are positively wrong, crops up subsequently confusing the schooling of experience and representing the lesson it teaches in a false light. If the youth was previously in the dark, he will now be led astray by a will-o'-the-wisp, and with a girl this is still more frequently the case. They have been deluded into an absolutely false view of life by reading novels, and expectations have been raised that can never be fulfilled. This generally has the most harmful effect on their whole lives. Those men who had neither time nor opportunity to read novels in their youth, such as those who work with their hands, have decided advantage over them. 
Few of these novels are exempt from reproach, nay, whose effect is contrary to bad. Before all others, for instance, Gil Blas and the other works of Lesage, or rather their Spanish originals, further, The Vicar of Wakefield, and to some extent the novels of Walter Scott. Don Quixote may be regarded as a satirical presentation of the error in question, 